Welcome to the Secret to Secret podcast. My name is Simeon and it's my honor to introduce to you today our first ever guest on the podcast, Dr. Christopher M. Beish. Chris is Professor Emeritus at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Youngstown State University, where he taught for 33 years. His work explores the philosophical implications of non-ordinary states of consciousness, particularly psychedelic states. He has authored four books, his latest one being LSD and the Mind of the Universe, or, as Chris prefers to call it, Diamonds from Heaven. In Diamonds from Heaven, Chris combines his expert knowledge of the world's wisdom traditions with the insights he personally gained from 20 years of intense, high-dose psychedelic work undertaken in secrecy. And um, the cosmic plan that revealed itself to Chris is both astonishing and beautiful and carries great implications about the way we should understand our individual and our collective existence. Chris and I split our conversation neatly into two parts. So in the first half of the podcast, you can get some more details on the general areas that Chris's work focuses on and the general chronology of his work. But if you're familiar with Chris's work, feel free to skip ahead halfway where we delve into issues that Chris hasn't spoken about in length before, such as the nature of suffering and evil, and also how reincarnation and the non-self can both be true at the same time. One final note, please bear with me as I get this podcast up and running. I know that video quality and audio quality on my end are pretty bad, but um, I promise better quality in the future. And fortunately, Chris does most of the talking here, so it shouldn't be too much of a I hope the beautiful conversation Chris and I had brings you joy and wisdom, same as it brought me. And I hope you enjoy. Thank you for watching. Good. So, uh, so, so to begin, would you like to kind of give a general overview of your work that kind of you talk about in the book, what the book is about and what your experiences really were? Yeah. Well, it all began right after I finished graduate school in 1978. I had started, I started my career as a professor of religious studies at Youngstown State University in Ohio. And I read Stan Groff's first book, Realms of the Human Unconscious. And I knew immediately that this was critically important work to my discipline, which was philosophy of religion. And Stan outlined a methodology that allowed us to enter systematically and carefully and, and safely into these deep states of consciousness in which we could not only heal, but explore the deepest levels of our mind and entering into those levels, dropping into deeper levels of consciousness that went beyond individual mind. So that excited me very much as a young philosopher. I thought this was great. This is a whole new philosophical method. So I began to do this work. <clears throat> and to do it, of course, since it was illegal at the time, I had to make a choice, and I don't like doing things illegal, but I made a choice to divide myself in half. And in my daytime job for the next 33 years, I was a professor of religious studies at Youngstown State University, teaching courses and doing the things that people do. And then my nighttime job, I began this systematic journey into deep, non-ordinary states of consciousness uh, using LSD. And I used LSD because that was the substance that Stan had worked with in his early years. That's what his research was based on primarily. And I trusted what I saw in his work. Uh, so I used that. <clears throat> And after my sessions, my work was always following the protocols that he laid out in his early book, LSD Psychotherapy. They were always uh, protected from the world. They were always private. I worked with a sitter. Uh, I was always lying down with carefully choreographed music, uh, uh, pacing the stages of opening and closing in the sessions. And I made a very careful and sustained effort to record each session faithfully and completely after the session was over. So I began this work. I did it intensely for four years. 
And then for reasons that I describe in the book, I stopped the work for six years. And then I resumed it for another 10 years of work. I started in 1979 and I finished it in 1999. I did 73 high dose sessions over this 20 year period. I started with three medium dose sessions and then went into all the rest of my sessions were high dose sessions, which I worked at 500 to 600 micrograms, which is a protocol that I don't recommend. I don't recommend such a, a long sustained hammering of uh, the boundaries of consciousness exploding so relentlessly into these, this work. I would work much differently if I did it again today. I would work more slowly. I would alternate high doses with low doses. And I would work, I would balance uh, LSD with more body grounded or psychedelics such as psilocybin and ayahuasca. But what happened on the journey basically is that I went through not just one death, not just ego death, but the universe took me in gradually through multiple layers of reality, deeper and deeper through deeper levels of consciousness. And I found that entering deeper levels of consciousness and therefore and through them accessing deeper levels of reality required going through a series of deaths, uh, dying, at one level of consciousness to enter a deeper level of consciousness and then mastering or learning the ins and outs of that level and then going through yet another death to enter in a yet a still deeper level of consciousness. So when I got to the end of the journey and was looking at all of the years of work, I basically asked myself how many fundamental levels of reality did I experience or how many cycles of death and rebirth. And I, I came up with five. There was a level that took place at the level of collective mind, uh, excuse me, personal mind, ego death. Then there was a level that took place at the level of collective mind, the collective mind of our species. Then there was a level that took place at, at archetypal mind. And then the level of causal reality, the level of oneness. And then in the five last years of my work, uh, the level of diamond luminosity, what I call diamond luminosity, uh, what Buddhism calls the absolute, of the absolute, the clear light of absolute reality. So after I finished my sessions, uh, spirit said to me in my meditation, 20 years in, 20 years out. And I took that at the time to mean that it would take me 20 years to fully assimilate and integrate 20 years of my sessions. As it turned out, uh, LSD in the Mind of the Universe, or as I prefer to call it, uh, Diamonds from Heaven, was published exactly 20 years after I finished my sessions. So there was 20 years of exploration followed by 20 years of digesting, reflecting, integrating, and finally uh, telling the story of this journey. And I share it in the hope that it will be useful to other people, both people who are journeyers, but also people who are not journeyers, who are involved in spiritual practices other than psychedelics because of the, uh, I hope the cosmology that emerges in the story and the, and the understanding of some of the cosmological processes that we are all engaged in will be useful to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, your work is definitely fascinating. And um, w one thing I think that is very important to address whenever somebody's talking about psychedelic states and insights that arise from them, I think the, the go-to argument of the skeptic is these are states that appear while the mind is under the influence of a substance. Uh, therefore, why should the, any insights gained be legitimate? But even to take this argument mm -hmm. further, when you are exploring, um, uh, when you're having your experiences under the, the, the influence of these substances, how do you know what you are studying? How do you know what you're seeing? Is this the cosmos? Is this your personal psyche? What is it that you are experiencing? Yeah, really an important question, isn't it? Can we trust 
what emerges in our awareness in psychedelic states of awareness. Well, I took my starting point from Stan's observations and many other psychedelic therapists in the early years, and that is an understanding that psychedelics don't give you an experience. What they simply do is amplify your own consciousness. They are an amplifier and a catalyst of your own mind. And if you use these hours of amplified awareness carefully, if you focus them and internalize them and keep your vision focused on the stream of awareness that's arising within you, you begin a process of purification and a process of confrontation with the different blocks and pains and things we'd rather not look at in our daily life. Your system just spontaneously moves to eliminate those challenges which are lodged in our history. Sometimes our history from just this lifetime, sometimes our history from former lifetimes. <clears throat> in the early stages, we know that uh, we can uh, judge the legitimacy of what's a what we are experiencing because these are activating memories from our lifetime. We can verify those memories. We can explore them. They have the texture of memory. And when we confront the pains that arise there, there is a liberating experience. There is a healing experience, which has demonstrable impacts on our daily life after a session has ended. So there's a tremendous sense of verification of the truth of what one is encountering. And that tends to give confidence that when one moves beyond the familiar, when one moves beyond the domain of one's immediate life, that there is a truth also in these experiences, even though they're coming from a more foreign level of consciousness. And this process repeats itself. So you, one enters into a reality which is completely foreign, unknown, strange. Uh, and at first, maybe what stands out is its strangeness. But the more frequently you go back into that reality, the more you become familiar with its landscape. And my experience is that if you engage these hours carefully, and if you record them and, re and work hard to retain them, listen to what it's teaching you, the universe enters into a dialogue with you. It's like now it knows you're paying attention and so it's speaking to you. And it takes you through an educational process. It takes you through a series of, of lessons about how reality works here, uh, what's going on at this level of reality. And in the early stages, there are certain qualities that relate to your personal life maybe. Uh, you experience your personal life in a larger in a larger spiritual trajectory. You may have insights into former lives. You may have insights into your deeper former life history that clarifies and heals relationships in your present life. And because these have such a dramatic impact on our present life, once again, their legitimacy is... Um, confirmed in your own life experience. And as one goes deeper into collective mind, into archetypal reality, into deeper into spiritual reality, in this case, I had, I was fortunate in that I had uh, a PhD in um, philosophy of religion. I had a lot of opportunity to study some of the great spiritual traditions of the world. So I was familiar with some of the ins and outs of spiritual practice as those have been developed in different countries. I had an understanding of their maps of what lies in the spiritual world. And so I had a, a reference point to compare my experiences in psychedelic states with the experiences that other spiritual seekers were having in their traditions using meditation methods, yogic methods, or psychedelic methods uh, to explore reality from across the world. Now, I've always taken a, a global perspective. When I teach, I taught Intro to World Religions for years. I taught courses on comparative mysticism. And I've always found that the deepest patterns that emerge, or the, for me, the most interesting patterns, are the patterns that emerge not simply in one culture, in one spiritual tradition, 
but in multiple traditions looked at simultaneously. And when you can hold the world's spiritual traditions in your consciousness all at the same time, then you begin to see patterns that connect the different lineages into larger wholes. And I found that my psychedelic experiences fit comfortably within that larger landscape. And I, I have to qualify because it, it fit comfortably. And yet, as I went deeper, it also pushed the boundaries of those experiences and took me deeper. But I guess in addition to this sort of personal verification and then collective global spiritual correspondence, which is a kind of verification, there is an experiential quality to these experiences. Uh, you pay a great price to enter into these states. You must go through multiple, multiple cycles of purification, detoxification, confrontation with your own limitations, layer after layer, in order to enter into clear states of perception, clear states of awareness. These states of awareness have a quality where it's just transparently clear that you are experiencing something real, something genuine. It doesn't mean necessarily that you're seeing all that exists or everything that's there, or that it's not that there can't be limitations or distortions in your experience, but you know you are confronting something which is just as real as what you confront in time-space reality. So in this dialogue, in this dance, um, my conviction grew that I was on a journey, uh, a journey that had philosophical value, a journey that was producing genuine insights into how our universe works, the structure of the universe. Doesn't mean that everything I saw is necessarily perfectly correct, but there is a, a fundamental conviction that these are real, that these are valuable. And they're shared by other persons. If it were only my experiences, then maybe they would just be a solipsistic fantasy. But by comparing your experiences to the experiences of other psychedelic explorers, and in this respect, Stan Groff's compendium of so many hundreds and thousands of psychedelic journeyers and their experiences gave me confidence that what I was experiencing was not simply a personal illusion or a personal fantasy, but was flowing in accord with what other psychedelic journeyers had experienced. And then by comparing them to the cosmologies of meditation traditions, it gave me confidence that psychedelics were not, psychedelics were just a key that were giving us access to states of awareness, which are universal. And you can get access to these states using other methods as well. I see. So, and you began your work with the um, motivation to explore the universe as a philosopher. Is that correct? Yeah, that was my intention. I'm not a therapist. I wasn't, I mean, I've received much healing in this work and always grateful for it, but that was not my primary intention. I was trained as a philosopher of religion. I wanted to explore the universe as deeply as I could and understand not only my nature, but understand the larger landscape of the universe. And, and you're saying that despite the fact, so the fact that your experiences fit in kind of the larger body of religious and philosophical traditions we have as a species gave you confidence that what you're experiencing is genuine. But at the same time, you also push the boundary in terms of seeing things that you had not encountered before and elsewhere. So uh, keeping this in mind, do you believe that psychedelics um, offer the promise of new insights that we can gain philosophically and spiritually that we have not uncovered before? Um, how do you see psychedelics mm -hmm. fitting into the future developments of philosophy and spirituality of our species? Yeah. Well, this, this is an exciting time and exciting territory. Uh, I became convinced early on that psychedelics represented a true before and after development in philosophical reflection. 
because in philosophical reflection, in one way or another, we are always reflecting upon the breadth of human experience, not only our own experience, but other people's experiences. And we here have an opportunity to temporarily deepen our consciousness, deepen our awareness, and push the boundaries of awareness. And I think this opens up not only individual selective insights into the nature of consciousness, but it also opens up the possibility of an entire new method of exploration, which was first articulated, I think, by William James, well, in modern times. It, it, there are ancient prototypes of this work in the Eleusinian mystery schools and in the ayahuasca churches of Brazil, but in Western philosophy, probably first articulated by William James, and that is a systematic rhythm of expanding consciousness, experiencing what you can experience, coming back, recording it, evaluating it, comparing it to other bodies of knowledge, comparing it to other people's experiences, and then expanding again, going out again, coming back, same process, writing it down. This rhythm of expansion and then evaluation, expansion and evaluation, I think opens up the possibility. It allows us to explore dimensions of consciousness that are, for the most part, for most people, unless they have are lifelong spiritual practitioners of some of the meditative arts, for most people, these dimensions of consciousness are invisible. They just lie outside the purview of their awareness. But by systematically entering into these temporary states, we can explore them, we can taste them, we can sample them, and we can gather insights about how the universe is working. Because we find that all the awareness, all the intelligence, all the compassion, which is inside us, it's not something which has been assembled by mechanical chances, by mechanical processes, which are driven by random variation as the modern mind thinks. But we find that our mind opens into an infinite mind, something which is ultimately an infinite mind. It opens up into the species mind, the collective unconscious of our species, into deeper and deeper levels beyond the species, and ultimately into the mind which is the generative mind of the universe itself. At least that's my experience. Now, philosophically, we've been talking about that mind for years, even in denying its existence, if you choose the atheistic alternative. But we've been wanting to know about, we've been asking questions about our larger place in the cosmos most, whether there is meaning in our lives, whether there is intention in the evolutionary project. What the hell is going on? Why does life hurt so much? Why is there so much suffering? I mean, these are core philosophical questions that in the modern mind, many philosophers have just abandoned and just said they're unanswerable. We can't know. So we're going to change the topic of discussion. But still, as long as we live, we want to know the answer to these questions. Psychedelics, I think, give us an opportunity to systematically and rigorously engage these questions. And that's a turning point. Because ideally, for example, I think we would want to take a hundred people, say, the best educated people, most creative people, with PhDs in multiple disciplines, and then go through the same systematic regimen of disclosure, encounter, and then compare the notes of all these people and see what is the collective patterns that they're, what is the common ground that they see and recognize. This tokens, I think this is what's beginning to happen. This is what we're doing. This is what we will be doing for hundreds of years. And this is a turning point in philosophy. This really marks a difference between old philosophy, which was done on the basis of just sensory consciousness and a new philosophy, which is done on the basis of this new technology, this new technology of encounter. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's really uh, momentous changes that seem to, to yeah. be coming within the psychedelic renaissance, which seems to be happening at the moment. Um, mm. But uh, yeah. for, for our viewers, that um, in your book, you have a really nice section where you um, describe a day in the life uh, a, a few 
doing your psychedelic session. Uh, mm -hmm. For those of our listeners and viewers that are not aware of it, would you go through it and tell us what your protocols really were and how a typical session day would go? Well, there's a chapter in the book, um, basically a session day, because some of the readers, early readers of the manuscript asked me to do just this, to kind of take them into a typical day. So here's a typical day. Uh, all my sessions took place in my house or in my wife's um, therapeutic office. Uh, they always began in the early morning. I was always, uh, I would begin with meditation or yoga or some type of centering practice to get myself centered. And the more I worked with these states, the more important I paid to, more parts I understood was the uh, preparation, um, not only the preparation of set and setting, which is well appreciated today, but a lot of attention to my emotional state and my physical state, a lot of practices uh, purifying my body, making sure that my, literally my physical bone structure was aligned. Because when you enter into these states, if you are not really, um, balanced, open, porous, in, in good condition, uh, you can get into, all, into various complications and energy gets jammed up in your body. But the day, the day would start early morning. I would uh, go through my practice and then uh, my sitter for all the 20 years of my work was my first wife, Carol, who was a clinical psychologist. And uh, basically, after these early preparations, I would take the psychedelic and then I would turn over responsibility to, to my condition to her, to my protection. She would take care of me. She would um, make sure I was safe. She would make sure that I would stay focused inwardly, that I would not allow myself to get distracted or act out in any dangerous way. I, for the most part, because I was working with very high doses of LSD, there was no verbal interaction. I was listening to music. She was the curator of music responsible for intuiting when to shift from one stage to another. There are certain stages in a psychedelic session. I would basically do the work as long as it lasted, which is usually six to eight hours. She was with me the whole time, making sure I was safe until I was back and consolidating. Uh, and then I would spend that evening uh, reflecting on the sessions, thinking about it, trying to put together the first map of what had happened in the sessions. And often I didn't sleep much the day after a session. Uh, but the next day, it was always a priority to make a written account of the session. And when you're entering really foreign territory, uh, making an accurate written record can be challenging. Now, some people who have artistic abilities can uh, draw them or paint them. Uh, Alex Gray's work, such wonderful work, other psychedelic artists, I don't have those skills. So for me, it was making a written record. And in order to learn how to capture experiences that are so elusive and so far beyond our ordinary way of knowing, I developed a technique. Um, I called it standing at the edge of the well. The day after a session, you're still porous around the edges, but your verbal and cognitive functions have returned. So what I would do is I would play the music that was used in the session in exactly the same order that it had been played in the session. And I would get back into the mood or the psychological space of the that I was in when the, this music was being played. And from that condition, one foot in the, the session, one foot out, I would write up that portion of the experience. And when I was done with that, I'd shift to the next piece of music and play it over and over until I had captured as best as I could what had been happening during that music. And when I was done, I had my draft of the session. Once I had that draft, I locked it. I didn't change it. I learned that by trying, sometimes trying to improve the text or make it a little more polished, that you lose something that is contained in the original raw language. 
So once I had that text, I locked it. Uh, yeah. And then I would spend weeks, months sometimes, uh, basically studying the sessions, trying to understand it, put it in the context of previous sessions. On average, I was doing about five sessions a year. That's kind of, statistically, that's what it worked out. So I had plenty of time in between my sessions to digest and assimilate them. And I was also doing spiritual practice during this time. I was always meditating. So the day after a session always began with meditation, which is a nice spacious place to be able to open up and just let the energy that had been running in you during a session flow uh, in you in your meditative space. So that's basically what a session looked like. I would not eat anything before breakfast, always an empty stomach because I would throw up often because, you know, people don't think you throw up on LSD, but you do, you know, this is, it's one of the symptoms of shifting states of energy. So your body has some challenge adjusting to these more intense states. Uh, and I would eat something light at the very end of the day. Mm -hmm. There's uh, so many things I'm curious about the, your particular approach. Uh, but one thing in particular for me is um, music. I want to ask you about the way you use music. Mm -hmm. Because music and psychedelics have always had a very special relationship, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And there have been different approaches. So, for example, Terence McKenna is famous for saying five dry grams in silent darkness. That was his recommendation. And he... Mm -hmm. He once famously joked that if you come out of a psychedelic session saying Bach was a genius, well, you know, everybody knows that. <laughs> so <laughs> his approach rather was to kind of um, let the experience take you where it takes you. But you were, mm -hmm. as I read in your book, were very particular in the, your choice of music and it changed as you progressed in your, in your work. Um, mm -hmm. There was also one very funny moment in which your your sitter put on the the, the wrong piece of music yeah. but this this actually helped you get out of a very kind of difficult situation so yes mm -hmm. what what's your approach with music well music does influence our experience and I, and i do value um working without music i mean i i've continued to work with psychedelics after stopping my high dose lsd work but, and during this post LSD work, I often will just enter into meditative space uh, with psilocybin or ayahuasca. And in the psychedelic work itself, in the late years, in the late sessions, I would often um, end the music in the second half of the session and just move into meditative space. But basically, I followed the protocol that was kind of laid out in the early psychedelic research. And the understanding here is not that music um, gives you experiences, but that music can support the underlying immersion of your unconscious into your awareness. So it just kind of provides a, a background that makes it easier for you to detach from the habits of your mind and to go with the flow, as it were, into what emerge, is emerging. So I, I think it, of it as supporting and reinforcing what happens when you do go simply into the dark uh, without any music at all. And we know that there are stages of the LSD experience. Uh, there's a, it takes so many minutes for it to begin to become active. It builds in potency. Again, you have to look carefully at the psychedelic you're using, the, the uh, curve of activation on it, the depth of activation. Um, it's different if you're working with low doses of LSD than if you're working with high doses of LSD. Uh, working as I did with high dose levels, there was a tremendous acceleration of consciousness, a tremendous speed with which your body and your mind is adjusting to the extraordinary increase of energy and, and awareness as you begin to break through the bounds of personal consciousness. And so there are Helen Bonney's early work on the stages of psychedelic uh, of a psychedelic session and the type of music that supports that session. 
So I follow those early guidelines, uh, which have been further expanded in the Holotropic Breathwork Network, which has a, a good, large library of musical recommendations. I found, I, I came across early on uh, in about, oh, by about the fifth or sixth or seventh session, I came upon uh, some indigenous chanting, types of indigenous chanting. And I found that that music had a much more powerful impact on my, on my experiences than listening to classical music, even new pieces of classical music. And, and I did listen to lots, but they still kept within conventional, they kind of kept within a more conventional framework. And I found that indigenous music that was foreign, that was unknown, that I didn't understand the words of, and they had a, a, a more of a, a cathartic opening effect in my consciousness. So I found it very useful, and I, I began to collect all manner of indigenous music and in different cultures from around the world, and I incorporated them into my sessions. And then when you are at peak, when you've gone through, you've eventually you've gone through the purification or the death process and you've transitioned into deeper uh, ecstatic reality, into visionary states, uh, you want music which is more expansive, which is kind of gives your mind room to work, so to speak. Just very, very expansive. And then as you begin the long, slow descent, uh, LSD has a long tail, so that's a long, slow process, which is really one of the nice advantages of LSD. It gives you time inside the session to integrate, reflect upon, to compose yourself with respect to the experiences that you've just had. So you want long, gentle, gentle, expansive uh, music. In all of the work, until the very end, uh, you don't want any words in English or any words in your native language, words which you can understand because you don't want them to script your experience. Best to, uh, well, I found that I would only really could use music three times before I had to let it go for the most part uh, because by the time you've used music several times, it tends to get saturated with the experiences that you had with that music. So when you listen to the music, it tends to take you back into where you were before, not where you are now. So I would really limit myself to using music only a few times, and then I had to find new music. When you're in the downward slope, when you're coming back into your more familiar life, then that applies less. I am more comfortable using uh, uh, more familiar music in the spacious return. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, also, well, another thing about your sessions also, I think, which a person that, who is not familiar with your work and who is not familiar with the mm -hmm. psychedelic work at all would think, okay, here is this person, he's having these uh, visionary experiences, it's all very nice and very interesting, and he's writing about mm -hmm. them. So it must be very exciting, very pleasant work. But I think anybody a little bit familiar with the psychedelic experience would know that these are especially high dose experiences are very uh, difficult experiences to go through. So some, especially, I know that your initial sessions, uh, you write about them, they were very expansive, very exciting, but as time went on, uh, they became more and more difficult and difficult times uh, started appearing more often and they were harder to go through. So at some point, I'm sure it was difficult for you to, uh, to kind of go through it again, knowing what's probably waiting for you that it's going to be a day of really difficult experiences. So um, so in the light of this, how did you work with daily spiritual practice to uh, help you prepare for this? And also not only for this, but also to kind of incorporate um, your, your insights into your daily life. Because as you've said previously, these psychedelic experiences, we cannot hold on to them. So we need to find ways to integrate them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me try to hold on to two parts to your question. First of all, um, the method of working with high dose LSD. And then um, 
issues of the challenges that come up, or the three things, the challenges that come up in high dose work. And third, integrating those experiences into daily life. So if I get lost in my answer, you bring me back to those three. Okay? Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, Stan's early work differentiated very clearly between low dose psycholytic therapy and high dose psychedelic therapy. Low dose psycholytic therapy is kind of much more similar to what is being done today. Uh, the goal here is to amplify consciousness, but not but do it in a way where the unconscious unfolds itself gradually layer by layer, taking us systematically kind of more, uh, less traumatically into the inner confrontation uh, that heals. Their psychedelic work is very different. And it, what stands out in my mind is their work at the Spring Grove Hospital in uh, Maryland where they were basically working with a different population. They were working with terminally ill cancer patients. So they were working with people who were going to die. And they were trying to trigger an encounter with cosmic reality. They were trying to trigger essentially an NDE, a near-death experience, that would give them a foretaste of where they were going when they died. Uh, and they, this protocol limited high dose sessions to three sessions, no more than three sessions. So this is a very different protocol. It wasn't really trying to heal all the layers of personal issues. It was trying to blow through the personal unconscious and go into uh, cosmic reality just to get a taste, to get a sample. So I thought, well, if you can do that three times, you can do it more than three times and uh, just let's go for it. Let's just go for it and see how deeply we can go. And in doing that, I found it took me about uh, two years of work, about 10 sessions to basically go through what Stan calls the perinatal level of consciousness, where I lived my birth and relived various, very strong physical, emotional confrontations, existential crises, questioning the meaning of existence, the meaningfulness, the futility of life, all the things one goes through in those initial and early experiences. And then I went through kind of a classic ego death experience where my, my individual identity was shattered. It was turned inside out. I was forced to become the exact opposite of everything I knew myself to be. And in that process, Crispacious life, crispacious historical existence ceased to be the container of my consciousness. I just moved into a more expansive awareness beyond the historicity of crispacious life. As I went deeper, I began to experience a very, very different order of challenges that were not personal. I began to be systematically taken into vast territories of pain and suffering, violence and wars and just brutal. Uh, it's like Dante's Inferno, except many times worse. Uh, and this was much harder than experiencing my, the doubts of metaphysical anxiety or the, you know, my personal ego death. This was something different. Uh, but here's the thing. I would spend hours in this condition and it was difficult. And going back into it to the next session, I had to really steel myself to prepare myself to enter into this domain once I knew that it was coming. But I would spend a couple of hours or a few hours in this process and then it would reach a crescendo and it would spin me out into the visionary state. It would spin me out into the ecstatic visionary state. And when that happens, the pain of the very intense pain of the ocean of suffering was balanced and proportionate to the great ecstatic joy that followed in the ecstatic portion of those sessions. So when you understand this cycle, when you understand the pattern, that there will be this very intense period of pain in some form or another, 
but this is going to be followed by an even deeper immersion into ecstatic visionary experience. You, you, uh, it's not just that the sessions become pain filled. There is a new layer of pain, but there's also a new layer of insight and ecstasy and joy. And that's what gives you the strength to return and keep coming back to these states. And that, that tremendous sense of, uh, ecstatic visionary encounter cosmological inquiry and so as i went as the the ocean of suffering lasted two more years and i went through that level and then i went through yet another death rebirth process and then came into uh, another deeper level of consciousness archetypal reality and moving deep into the collective psyche and, and archetypal psyche and then going through a yet another death and rebirth, went into the ecstasy of uh, oneness, the ecstasy of causal reality for an entire year, just experience after experience of different levels of, uh, of oneness, parameters of oneness. So the challenge does increase, but the payoff also increases as you go deeper. So it's, uh, I've always considered that trade-off a good exchange. I've always been a volunteer in this process. Nothing was done to me. I always was willing to go there. And the rewards that I was given for the engagement uh, always made it worthwhile. I wouldn't trade these 73 days for anything, any of the treasures of the world. That's beautiful. Um, about the psychedelic work, one thing that um, I've noticed is that um, they psychedelic work parallels in a certain way just what people would call normal uh, spiritual daily practice. So yes. let's say if, some, if somebody reads your book but entirely forgets the fact that uh, you were entering into psychedelic states, they could read it as a report of a person going through intense daily meditation practice, let's say, yes. because I think these cycles of purification and then expansive insight and, and, and bliss appear in normal states of consciousness. So yes. in, in, a, in, a much, in a much kind of smaller scale, but I think there's essentially a mirroring almost fractal like uh, par par parallels between psychedelic states and real life. Yes. Um, and kind of why I'm really interested into how you've used uh, daily spiritual practice is mm -hmm. because I um, essentially think that there shouldn't re there should be this continuity between daily practice and psychedelics is very important. I think because yeah. uh, Ram Das used to say that uh, you know. That, going on an LSD trip is like being with Buddha or Jesus in a room for two hours, but then you have to leave. And then the art is kind of staying in that room for as long as you can without any substance. So what, what, what are your views on that? Yeah. Well, I completely agree with you that there's nothing unique uh, about psychedelic experiences because they are amplifiers of consciousness. So it's consciousness that does the work in the end. Uh, it's not psychedelics that do any unique work it's consciousness i've had many readers write me and say you know i've never taken a psychedelic in my life but i completely relate to what you're describing it mirrors my own experience uh, in terms of these breakthroughs and levels or this particular part of the experience so i know we know that there is a uh, profound overlap and continuity between our work in ordinary spiritual pro let's say non-psychedelic spiritual practice and psychedelic spiritual practice. And it's more than just that. I mean, basically, in order to understand what happens in psychedelic sessions, we have to have an understanding of what's happening in life, what, how life works. Now, for me, uh, reincarnation is just a fact of existence. You know, that's my first book was on reincarnation, and I consider the empirical evidence supporting a reincarnational worldview is just overwhelming at this point. It doesn't mean that we understand how it all works, all the details of it, but that there is a continuity arcing through multiple lifetimes in a larger 
developmental evolutionary process is really important to understand. So in order to understand this rhythm of where we are, we die and we, our consciousness gets large into the soul territory, we incarnate and we get small and focused and we die and we get large and we incarnate, we get small and focused and we keep going back, back and forth. And it's like every time we incarnate, we choose a certain set of issues. We choose a certain set of, uh, of challenges that we face and confront. And as we face and confront those things, our life develops. It, you know, sometimes we don't do so well. We flunk the course. Other times we do very well. We're passed and moved on. And this rhythm uh, shows itself inside every life and across multiple lives when we, are, when we go through if we look at long strings of our of lives as in past life therapy or that type of work. And in this sense, I think what LSD, what any spiritual practice does and psychedelic spiritual practice does is that it accelerates this process where reincarnation moves very slowly and grinds very finely. But if you want to speed up the process, you can turn awareness back onto itself and look at where awareness is coming from. Examine and engage their challenges that you are facing in the outer world in their core nuclear form when they exist as thought forms within your consciousness. If you don't do that, they will eventually, these thought forms will manifest as your outer physical reality. But if, and, and you'll learn from them. But if you speed up, the, want to speed up the process, you can look at them in their nuclear form and engage them before they manifest in the physical world. This happens in spiritual practice, uh, in meditative practice, and it also happens in psychedelic practice. So I completely agree with you. The more I've worked with psychedelics, the more I'm convinced that if you want to open yourself up to these temporary states of consciousness, it's very important to be practicing, have a daily spiritual practice. In fact, the deeper the state of consciousness you enter temporarily, the stronger should be your daily practice. Because when you open to these vast fields of energy, these vast territories of consciousness, uh, it, it places tremendous challenges. It makes it tremendous strains in a way, not only on your mind, but on your body, on your subtle energy system. And it's really important, I think, to uh, bring those experiences into a daily spiritual practice so that your, the conditions you move into in your spiritual practice, in your daily practice, give you a greater capacity to absorb and integrate and to navigate not only the insights, but the the experiences that emerged in your psychedelic states. In my psychedelic states, I was given many practices. I was given not just teachings and experiences, but I was basically told, do this, do that. You know, I was given practices and I would take those practices into my daily spiritual practice. In the last five years of my work, <clears throat> and there's a, I discuss this in the Diamond Luminosity chapter, I entered into um, Vajrayana Buddhism. I had always been a meditator, but I began a more formal relationship with Vajrayana teachers, and I began to practice within this Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And I found this was very helpful for where I was working at the time, because I was working at that time in very, very pure, and very intense states of awareness, diamond luminosity. And I was finding that it was getting increasingly difficult for this, for my subtle energy system to sustain the encounter with the enormous flows of pure energy in this diamond consciousness. And when I began to do these ancient practices, when I began to do Chud and the various deity practices of Vajrayana, I found that my physical and psychological and subtle energy systems were able to breathe more freely. It was like my Vajrayana practice gave me a space to enter 
that was midway between my physical consciousness and my psychedelic consciousness. And by entering those states, I was able to breathe and flow <clears throat> the energy that came into my psychedelic sessions. I could, I could channel that energy. I could, it, it just kind of moved more freely. It gave me a, an, a way of dialoguing with the universe that allowed my body and my mind to sort of breathe more comfortably. This was very helpful at the time. So I completely agree with you. I mean, the most important thing I think to remember about psychedelics in terms of spiritual practice is you can't take a psychedelic when you die. When you die, you go into the universe, you're all on your own. The mind you take is the mind you got. So knowing that, everything you do in your psychedelic work should be preparing yourself for that final encounter when you let go of the body and you enter into that world. You can't take psychedelics when you're dead. Now, I think psychedelics can give us, can teach us a lot about where we're going. <clears throat> it can prepare the soul for where it's going so that territory which may strike us as kind of strange and intimidating for an ordinary person when they die, we can encounter it as, you know, just a familiar route that we've traveled multiple times before in our psychedelic sessions. So I, I don't, I understand the tension for some teachers of classical meditation uh, and their criticism of psychedelics as kind of a false spirituality or um, distracting uh, experiences. I understand that, but for me, I've never found it to be an incompatible uh, approach to spiritual, a deepening spiritual experience. It's not the same. It does open up uh, different types of experiences, but if you understand spiritual practice, if you understand how spirituality, what spirituality is, I think that spiritual, that psychedelic work can reinforce and accelerate our daily spiritual practice in ways that are really very beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree with that. And also myself, I'm very interested in how one can uh, achieve synergies between, between the two. Um, now, in, in this last answer that you gave, you already touched upon some of the kind of uh, deeper um, mm -hmm. territories of your work. So I'm wondering whether you'd like to move into this and discuss the, 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 the cosmic blueprint that was revealed to you uh, during mm -hmm. your work. Um, mm -hmm. one, one, of the, one of the things that you talk about is reincarnation. And I find this very interesting. Uh, reading you, reading your book, uh, gave me kind of almost a permission to be interested, intellectually interested in, in reincarnation and not be shy about it. And mm -hmm. you, your work has really made me consider reincarnation in a serious way for the first time and kind of mm. discuss it with other people. Um, so you mentioned a number of books, a number of authors, and in fact, the kind of a large literature that exists that has documented cases that are well, suggestive of reincarnation. Um, yeah. So I was curious, what has convinced you of reincarnation uh, in your reading and in your personal experience? Yeah. Well, when I began my teaching at, at Youngstown State, I told you that Stan Groff was a, a major turning point in my life, but there was another author who was also a major turning point, and this is Dr. Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia. And uh, he's passed on now, but the work continues at Virginia, and he had spent a lifetime, he and his team, studying children from around the world, different cultures, different religious backgrounds or non-religious backgrounds. Children who, as soon as they begin to be able to talk when they're two years old, they begin to speak very matter-of-factly about their other life that they remember having lived. They describe people and places and events. They often have a very powerful emotional attachment to that previous life. They, they will run away from home sometimes just to return 
to the family that they knew in their previous life. So Stevenson has studied thousands of cases like this, and he's published hundreds of cases. Most of the cases he studied do not meet the highest levels of rigor required for um, verification and publication. But an amazing number of cases do allow themselves to be verified. So when I read his book, 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation, it just it absolutely showed me something that I had never encountered in graduate school, never in any of my studies, that reincarnation is a simple fact of life. These children who know things that they shouldn't know, that we can reasonably exclude other possibilities that they could have come through this knowledge through normal or physical channels, their parents talking or their neighbors talking or something they saw on television or in a newspaper, that we can reasonably eliminate those possibilities. And we have to confront the fact that these children know things that other people, that about other people's lives and have an emotional attachment and identification with, what, with that knowledge that seems clearly to indicate that there is continuity between the life experience of that previous life and their present life. And at the end of his career, uh, Stevenson published his monium opus in which he demonstrated uh, not only that our memory is continuous, but in some cases, even our bodies bear the marks of events that took place in our previous lifetime. That children, he, he studied 187 cases of children who had birthmarks or pigmentation or seeming scars on their body that reflected the death circumstances of a previous life. So someone who was stabbed in a previous life and they have a memory of that life had a birthmark where they were stabbed in a way that replicated that. Or someone who was hung had scars on their neck that seemed to correlate. This is a, an absolutely fascinating uh, study. And from there, once I was convinced by Stevenson's research that reincarnation was simply part of life, I went on to study the work of multiple past life therapists who were working with their clients to heal the wounds of their present life. Most of the time when you work in therapy, the wounds of your present life go back to some trauma or some disruption, uh, some unhappiness from our present life earlier in our life. Uh, but he, past life therapists consistently find that there's a certain percentage of pains which are not healed when you go back to your, form, to your present life. But when you allow your mind to open into your deeper history, then all of a sudden you are reliving a deeper story. You are remembering things that happened when you were a different person than you are now, but you remember them with the same sense of identification and self sense that you have for your present life. And when people do this, when they go back and relive the pains and the trauma or the conflicts that were present in their previous life, it has a healing effect on their present life. And after reading hundreds of cases like this, it just became more and more obvious to me that reincarnation is part of a, the larger rhythm of our life. It doesn't mean I agreed with all the interpretations of reincarnation. In fact, that's one of the things that came up in my sessions was an expansion of the model of what's taking place in reincarnation. But the fact of reincarnation, the fact that one life rolls into another life, rolls into another life with time in between. I mean, Michael Newton's work, um, a past life therapist, Life Between Life, his books, Journey of the Soul, uh, Journeys of the Soul and Destiny of Souls, has done fascinating work. Uh, he was doing conventional kind of past life regression therapy. And he, he made a mistake one day in one of his, with one of his clients. He gave an ambiguous instruction and suddenly he realized that his patients were described, his patient was describing what happened to them after they died. 
in the former life they had been reliving. So he discovered that people had the capacity not only to remember their former lives, but to remember what they were doing in between their incarnate lives. And so he, after he had regressed hundreds of people back into this in-between state, he began to write a series of books, Journeys of the, Journeys of the Soul, Journey of Souls, and Destiny of Souls, in which he basically compiled what his clients were telling him about the interlife state. And in there, it becomes, it's part of his discovery that people choose consciously their present, the conditions of their present life. That there is a process when you die, there is a debriefing process, a process of integrating back into the soul, integrating into the world of spirit, a, a process of maybe healing some of the unhappinesses that have been collected in your present lifetime. But then there is a period of refreshment and restoration and learning continues and there is a social structure to the, the post-mortem condition. But there comes a time when it's time for class to resume. It's, the soul begins a process of choosing the conditions of its next incarnation. This is, that, that basically, that really opens up a whole new understanding. It's in this sense, uh, now I think that just as kids and people in college, some people choose their courses very carefully and systematically with great forethought. And some people choose their courses kind of haphazardly or randomly, just picking what comes, what works in their work schedule and they get different results. I think it may be also the case for the souls. Some souls choose more carefully than other souls. But the idea that we choose our incarnation, we choose the circumstances of our incarnation, that it's an intelligent process. And by making choices of what we want to experience, doing our best in that experience, expanding out by becoming male, female, rich, poor, warrior, priest, artist, all these different varieties, we grow faster than we would grow if we lived all these years as one person, the same person. So sometimes with my students, I would say, imagine that you are the creative intelligence of the universe and you had two options. You could create a life that would live 100,000 years or you could create a life that would live the same 100,000 years but in 100-year increments. And every 100 years, they would change the circumstances of the life. At the end of 100 years, which do you think would produce the greater learning? <clears throat> and I think it's clear that the 100-year increment life would produce the greater learning. That's understanding that underneath the short-term experience of our present life, there is an accumulation taking place at the level of the soul, that the soul is learning, the soul is accumulating the experiences of all of our many, many lifetimes. And they aren't, that learning is not necessarily present in each individual life, but it's holding them like a library uh, in the spiritual reality. Now, this was... <clears throat> I saw this also in my sessions. I, I experienced, in some cases, former lives with people that I was engaged in in this present lifetime. There was healing that took place in these encounters. But I also was taken into a series of experiences which pushed the boundaries. <clears throat> there was a particular session, which I call the birth of the diamond soul, in which I experienced all of my former lives coming into me very quick. Just there was tremendous work had been done earlier in the session. And I was in a state where I was just seemingly integrating streams of consciousness from multiple lifetimes. And it was like wrapping string around a kite spool, filaments of white light. And they seemed to hit a critical mass at one point. And when they hit a critical mass, they fused all these lives fused into a single energy entity. And when they fused, there was an explosion of diamond light that it just exploded from my chest and it catapulted me into a completely different state of consciousness. I was an individual, but
but I was an individual beyond any frame of reference that I had previously known. I wasn't Chris Bache, but I was a being that Chris Bache was part of, and all of these other former lives were part of. And this is what I came to call the birth of the diamond soul. And it is the idea that life grows, that part of the intelligent process of life is growing human consciousness layer by layer, semester by semester, as it were, grade by grade, course by course, allowing us to expand and grow, hopefully more intelligent, more compassionate. We make mistakes, we learn, but we learn from those mistakes. We grow, we grow. But the process is not simply about becoming incrementally, gradually, more than we were. Sooner or later, there comes a time when all of those lives, all of their learning fuse and the soul consciousness awakens within us. I think in the normal process of reincarnation, we experience our soul when we die. So we go from ego to soul, back to ego, back to soul. But if we keep this up, thousands and thousands of years, thousands of years, sooner or later, it's a natural process that the soul wakes up inside time and space. I think this is what's happening not only for us individually, but it's what's happening for us as a species. We are in the process through our long, long history, our long evolutionary journey, our long learning process. We are in the process of transcending the ego and waking up, the soul is waking up inside time and space. This is, I think history is taking us into a time, into an epoch, when the diamond soul is waking up on earth. That's, uh, that's beautiful. Um, concerning this vision of reincarnation that you gained uh, through your experiences and through your reading, there are three particular issues that I, three particular questions that I have, which I think are very difficult to answer. And they yeah. arise as many other issues from the fact that it's difficult to talk about these things. Um, but the first issue, everybody knows, how, how can reincarnation be a how can consciousness travel from one biological mechanism into another? But we can leave that alone because it's probably beyond each one of us at the, at the moment. But then two other issues. I think the answer is we don't know. <clears throat> yeah. We don't know. We don't know what the physics of the soul is. We don't know how our memories leave our biological base and how consciousness kind of reprograms <clears throat> or returns to and integrates with a new biological body. We just don't have the answer to that question. But we won't begin to find the answers to that question and still we start asking different questions. We have to open up to a more complex cosmology of a multi-level universe and stop acting as if our consciousness is being generated and created by our brain. That's a reductive cosmology, which doesn't allow us to even begin to find the answers to the question you're asking. So I hope you're right. We don't know, but I think in time, we'll get more and more knowledge in that area. Yeah, hopefully that's, that would be a very interesting mm -hmm. thing to realize how it works. But mm -hmm. also when you talk about the soul, that's something that I'm very interested in because let's say if somebody's just doing um, uh, meditation practice, one of the key insights, uh, I think, of meditation is non-self, non-duality, uh, the co-arising of, of everything. So how does that stack up with the idea of a soul reincarnating? And what yeah. is reincarnating? Is, is, is it the doer, the, the, the thing that makes choices in the life, or is it the witness, the, the thing that kind of just is, is conscious yeah. of all of these things? Yeah. Uh, I've had those experiences of non-duality and what Buddhism calls emptiness, shunyata, emptiness of self, <clears throat> where there is an experience of such intimacy that there is no self inside you and also no self anywhere in the world. Everything is just open and pours and <clears throat> it's a magnificent experience. And I think it depends on how you think of the soul. If you think of the soul 
And I think this is kind of the way we are by habit and by custom have thought of the soul in the past. It's kind of what I think of as an atomistic theory of the soul in, con in contrast to a quantum or field theory of the soul. If you think of the soul as a fundamentally isolated unit, which does not change and is fundamentally isolated from other souls or other beings, then you have a problem because non-duality and shunyata, emptiness, is, is, it contradicts that atomistic notion of the soul. But if you have kind of a quantum model of the soul, if you have a soul as a field, as a, as a learning system, <clears throat> which is never isolated from the surrounding beings around it, from the surrounding world, which is always in an energetic exchange with that world, is always kind of incorporating information and energy from other in the waves of life, then I think we can concept, understand an understanding of soul, which is one dynamic. It's always changing. It's never fixed. It's always evolving through time. And it's porous. It's a reality which is porous. And yet it has individual, an individuality. It has, it is, I think the, the universe is a learning environment. It's learning in so many ways. It's learning at a, at a species level, but it's also learning at an individual level. We are learning. We are growing. We are holding on to our experience. We remember our experience. We acquire insights on the basis of that experience. It doesn't mean we're isolated from the world, and it doesn't mean we're static, but we are developing an individuality which is a porous individuality. So in the end, I don't think there is any contradiction between affirming an emergent individuality in creation and the fundamental condition of non-duality. And I think this is also affirmed in the spiritual traditions. Even the Dalai Lama has written that uh, what Buddhism rejects in rejecting it in its Anatta doctrine, it's no self doctrine. What it's rejecting is not individuality. What it's rejecting is a static soul, a soul which doesn't change in time, and a soul which is independent of other realities, independent of surrounding reality. Once you, want to, once you kind of shift your understanding of soul to this kind of open field vision, then I think it's completely compatible with shunyata, emptiness. And this open field vision of the soul, I think it also kind of um, leads into your observation that um, um, enlightenment isn't a private process. You were talking mm -hmm. about how, in particular, one thing I found very interesting is you would talk about how your experiences of purification and healing, you could see them affecting not only your personal sphere, but also the larger collective of humanity, which I found very interesting. And I wanted to understand how that, how that works and how that feeds into your vision of the future human. Um, mm. And yes, please tell us say a bit more about that. Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> Uh, you know, when I began this work, I thought I was doing this work for my personal edification, you know, for my personal healing, maybe even my personal spiritual realization. But I found that even though that was maybe my mindset, that wasn't the universe's mindset. It wasn't what was going on from its end. Uh, the mystery of the collective ramifications of our work, the collective import of our work, it's only a mystery if we start with the assumption that we are fundamentally private entities. But in the nature of the experience, both in classical meditative spiritual deepening and in psychedelic spiritual deepening, we discover that that's not the case. We discover that we are always and forever and always have been, always will be part of an interwoven network of life. And the image I like to use for this is the image of a tree and a leaf, leaf consciousness and tree consciousness. So imagine you were seeing a tree where 
all you could see all the leaves and imagine all the leaves were individually conscious. They had individual personalities and imagine that everything that was covered in bark was invisible. So all you could see were the leaves, but you could not see the trunk and the limbs of the tree. And imagine that one of these leaves decides to explore what is the real nature of his or her being. So he goes deep within and he finds that place in their inner being where they connect to the twig and pushing their consciousness deeper into the twig, into the limb, into the branch, and eventually into the very core of the tree and suddenly has the exploding awareness of what a tree is, sees the tree, experiences the tree, and therefore knows what a leaf is. The leaf is not a separate private part. A leaf is a living aspect of a much deeper, larger being. And that the well-being of the leaf is connected to the well-being of all the other leaves in the tree. That we truly are all in this together. And when that awareness dawns, then <clears throat> if that consciousness works its way back up into its leaf again, back into its leafness, now it sees all the other leaves in the tree as an aspect of, it, of this deeper identity which all leaves share. It would also say strange things like, there is no self, shunyata, it is anatta, meaning there is no private self, we're all here together. Compassion would spontaneously manifest because one would know that what you do to another leaf, you do to yourself because you're doing it to the tree. We're all individually connected. These are things that surface in all deep spiritual traditions. In the psychedelic practice, what I found is that when I would open deeply within, quote, myself, I would be involved in healing work and cleansing work that was not related to my personal history, but expanded beyond my personal history. In some way, it would be as if I were working to heal all the leaves on one particular branch of this particular tree. And, and this just happens spontaneously because nature doesn't hold the boundaries that we imagine exist in our private small mind. Nature lives as an integrated whole. Our species lives as an integrated totality. So it's just natural that when we open up to that totality, as we do with psychedelics, we, we enter into and we can dissolve completely into that reality. So it's not just that the leaf has a leaf experience of the tree. The leaf can dissolve into the essence of the tree and experience how the tree experiences life. The same thing happens in psychedelic work. We enter into purification processes which affect the tree, lows around us, and we enter into ecstatic joy, ecstatic experiences of intimacy with life, intimacy with the divine, which naturally, you can't contain it. It naturally radiates through your awareness into the awareness of all the beings around you. All spiritual traditions have recognized that our spiritual practice radiates through the fabric of the world, not just the human fabric, but the fabric of all reality, also the, the animal fabric uh, of the world. So, you know, I'm getting a little lost in the thought of that. It's just, it's just it becomes so natural. It becomes such a, a repeated experience that um, it helps me understand in some ways, the Buddhist tradition, that at the beginning of every meditation session or any spiritual practice, you begin by cultivating what they call bodhicitta, which is the desire to save all sentient beings. So you open, you're doing this practice not for your personal benefit, you're doing it for all beings. At the end of your practice, you give away all the benefit to all the beings of the universe at all the levels. So what you're doing is not just for your, is not for your own benefit. 
You're doing it for the benefit of the totality. And in doing that, you strengthen your awareness that you are a fractal aspect of the totality. And in that awareness, there is great liberation. There is great joy. Because, you know, you're, you, you just allow yourself to live and begin to live the larger life. And the larger life is what all the spiritual teachers and saints have been talking about. The, the compassion that treats your enemy as, as friends, the compassion where you open into deep time and you know that you are more, that you are not just this small you, which usually takes so much of our time and attention. You know that what you are is a piece of life which has infinite extension and infinite range and reach. And in that knowledge, there is the great relaxation, the great joy. You just, it dissolves alienation. It dissolves loneliness. One becomes once again what one has always been, but forgets. One becomes a joyful aspect of the totality. Chris, here I have... uh just all the quotes that I have taken from your book and so difficult choosing which one to go with. Mm. Uh, but there is one, one particular section in which you, I'm going to quote you directly. Um, here you talk about kind of the purpose of this whole exercise of reincarnation and learning. And mm. um, you, say, you say, on the other hand, I also felt an exquisite tenderness coming from the creator who experienced with us every pain we had taken upon ourselves. Humans were so precious to the Creator that not a single ounce of pain, not a single tear was wasted. The depth of that divine care so moved me that no sacrifice seems too large or unreasonable. And I think Mm -hmm. here you're talking about all the suffering that is involved in this process of learning and of a vision in which all of this kind of made sense for you, as as in it it didn't seem as meaningless suffering anymore. but this reminds me of, yeah. I, I don't know if you, if you've ever read, uh, The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. It's a great mm-hmm. novel that talks about mm-hmm. these issues. And at one point, there are these two brothers, Al- Alyosha and Ivan Karamazov, and they discuss the existence of God. And basically, Al- Alyosha is a faithful kind of servant of God, very pure of heart, but not so smart. And then there is Ivan Karamazov, who is exceptionally, he's essentially a genius. Uh, successful in every manner you can imagine, but a complete atheist. And when he talks about why he rejects God, he gives uh, pages upon pages of examples of cruelty inflicted upon children. And actually, Dostoevsky had taken that out of actual accounts of uh, uh, ch- children being tortured, being killed, being maimed. And this is very interesting because it reminds me of your experiences where at a certain point of your journey, you were faced by these, Im- not just images, but experiences of children being killed. The killing of the children. And yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think that is really the ultimate argument you can raise against this cosmic plan. Um, what justifies yeah. the suffering of innocent beings? What can justify this, 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 this suffering? Because eventually yeah. Ivan, Ivan Karamazov says, Perhaps there is a God. Maybe I do believe in God, but I do not accept the world that he has created. So what's your comment on that? That is the the hardest part of all of it, isn't it? Uh, How can we affirm an intelligence, let alone a compassion behind existence, operating through existence, when everywhere we look around us, there is so much pain, so much brutality, so much horror compounding over and over again, so much suffering. You know, Ramakrishna, the great Hindu saint, he said, if you want to understand God, you must be willing to look suffering in the face. And I really, I hold that and I, I really respect that. And I think it's really true. You, you can't, you must understand suffering. You must confront suffering and engage suffering. If you have any hope of understanding 
the true divine. Now, I'm really I'm very comfortable with atheism, and, and atheism is a rejection of theism. And depending upon the theism that we're talking about, most of the theisms that I know deserve to be rejected. Most of them are too small. Most of them are the the gods of so many religions are terrifyingly small, and the the vision of life that comes with them are terrifyingly inaccurate and, and inadequate uh, and do not provide anywhere near a, an adequate understanding of existence to help us understand the enormous pain that we're seeing. And I don't think I'm going to be able to succeed in, in, answering this question satisfactory, but it's a question I live with, and so I can only offer you a few things. In order to understand <clears throat> the suffering in life, we also have to understand genius in life. In order to understand what's happening in life's deficiencies, uh, children who are born without brains, you know, without, you know, we have to understand the larger trajectory of life. My sense of it is, and my experience of it is, when I have dissolved into what I experience as the creative intention of the universe, I dissolved into a process of creation, a process of manifestation, self-manifestation. First, that was just vast, just huge and ancient, just extraordinarily old, been going on so long, billions, billions of years, 13.8 billion years, they tell us, since this Big Bang, and we're not at all sure that this is the first of the Big Bangs. You know, so, and that the creative capacity of the universe extends not just to, you know, the, the microorganisms, the organisms on this planet, but entire galaxies and, and stars and the collapsing of stars and the emerging of planets and the evolution of life on the planets and just countless galaxies, countless galaxies. So we now are the first generation to truly appreciate the scale of the universe that we're involved in, both of its age and its expanse. And we've all been fascinated by the wonderful images coming from the Hubble telescope and other, other scopes that are giving us these magnificent pictures of the scale of existence. And it's in that context, I think, that we have to look at our own existence, our own species existence, and ask, what are we doing? What's happening here? If there is intelligence, how is this intelligence expressing itself here in our life? And in particular, why is it so hard? Why is life so hard? Why couldn't life be made easier? It's like, so I can believe in God, but I don't believe in, I don't accept the universe that this God has created. And, and I agree with those deep sentiments uh, because they honor our children. They honor life. And there is no justification on the surface like that for their suffering and their pain. But again, if we look at this in a context, a human being is a growing intelligence a human being is growing and its growth rests upon the shoulders of the primate kingdom, which rests upon the shoulders of, of other life forms which preceded the primates and so on down the evolutionary ladder. If we want to assess the condition and judge the condition, certainly we have to ask ourselves the question, are we at the end of this process? Are we, are we all that there is? Is this where it's going to end? Is this, is this what's happening? If you go to see a play and it's a 10 act play and you're only in the first scene of the first act, clearly you don't have enough information to know whether the play is a good play. You must see it through to the end. 
if you're on a car assembly plant and you're only at station three and there are 215 stations of the assembly plant and you're seeing something being built, but you don't even see enough to understand where it's going or what it is, then you just can't understand the process. And part of the advantages or one of the great advantages of working with psychedelic states is that it allows you under certain conditions to expand beyond this moment of time. It allows you to expand and to dissolve not only into the intelligence that's manifesting as the universe, that's manifesting as the life forms in the universe, but it also allows you to experience not only the distant past of this self-manifesting universe, but also the future of this self-manifesting universe, entering into what I call deep time. And my experiences in deep time have convinced me that there are dimensions in which the universe knows itself, which go far beyond this present moment. And in those encounters, in those dissolving into the deep future, I've been able to experience or have been given the experiences of something of the creative process, something of the, how creativity is expressing itself in human beings. And we come here to make choices. We make choices and we learned. We make bad choices, we have bad consequences. We make good choices, we have better consequences. But we're just getting started. We only became self-aware about 5,000 years ago. I mean, we only became aware of the consciousness that lies at the center of our being, our, our common, our deep consciousness. We only began to have access to that about 5,000 years ago. Self-awareness came earlier, but what the self is began about 5,000 years ago. And we are just getting started. We are just beginning to exercise the full potential which lies latent within the human being. And in that process, in that creative process, we are dealing with a very incomplete creation, a very incomplete planet, an incomplete species, and a species which in some ways is still living out of very barbaric, primitive levels of self-understanding, and in its primitiveness, in inflicts great damage on the beings around it. It's like the pain of being of an individual leaf is so terrible, we go insane and we inflict damage on other leaves. But it's not just that. It's like the process of evolution itself is incomplete, is still working it out, working things out. The process of organic evolution is incomplete. Sri Aurobindo said, humanity is a transitional species. We are not the end of the line. We are simply a transition going from a lower order of awareness into a higher order of awareness. When then when we stabilize at a higher level of awareness, we're going into yet a higher and a higher level of awareness. The ability of mind to be able to influence matter, the ability of mind to be able to manifest uh, joy, grace, fruition inside matter is still being developed. The ability of our mind to be able to control the diseases of the body, they're still being developed. We are basically so profoundly incomplete. Nature is so profoundly incomplete. My basic response to suffering is that it does reflect in certain ways the incompleteness of the universe. It also reflects the terrifying demands of learning through experience, of experiencing the consequences in some instances, not in all, but in some instances of, learn, of inheriting the consequences of choices that we've made so that we can learn from those choices and make better choices in the future. But not all suffering really derives from human choices at all. Some suffering just derives from what we would call the cruelties of nature. This planet is a severe place. 
Hurricanes come through and wipe out thousands of lives. Earthquakes wipe out thousands of lives. Biology takes out thousands of children. This is a very, very intense world. Uh, we must be willing to look suffering in the face if we want to understand the deeper, the deeper intentionality that is expressing itself in this very incomplete place and time. We tend to sort of see God as all perfect and static and unchanging, and therefore we hold God responsible for making this, that, and the other, but I don't think that's the way it is at all. We are cells in the being of God. We are cells in the being of the divine. The divine is not separate from any of the pain that the children are experiencing. The divine is not other than or distant from what's going on, what's taking place, but we ourselves within the emerging the divine. We are aspects of it. So the pain is always felt, always registered, always held. We are all in this together and we are growing together. Now here's the thing. If we were to stop the whole process right now, if we were to hold the creative intent, the designer accountable for just where we are right now, then we would have to conclude it's a bastard. He's a bastard because it's just too much pain. There's too much pain. But if we were able to go forward in time, if we could go even such a short distance of time of 100,000 years from now and experience an evolved humanity, what we're becoming, what we're in the process of becoming, we would experience a much kinder humanity, a much more gracious humanity, a much more intelligent humanity, a much more compassionate humanity, a humanity that was much better able to manage still the fluctuations of nature, which are so painful and so catastrophic. And we just, it's hard to envision where this is going, where this is taking us. Now, <clears throat> this brings me to the, the, the deeper part of your question, where are we now in this process? Where, what is, what's happening in our historical circumstances? What is the future, the immediate future for our species? And here, I know that I'm sharing just my own visionary experiences. I know that what may be powerful and true for one person would not necessarily be powerful or true for another person. So I can only share with you what my experience has been. Early on in my sessions, oh, starting at around the 23rd session, so for the last 50 of my sessions, one of the recurring themes of my sessions was <clears throat> that where humanity is going, where we're, what's happening. And the vision was over and over repeated we are coming into a turning point in history. We're coming into a decisive before and after point uh, that we were poised on the edge of a magnificent transition into a, a higher level of functioning, uh, that, there was, that there was a greatness in emerging within humanity. And when I look around at history, I thought, I'd say, well, I don't exactly see that. I see people being just as stupid now as they were, you know, 5,000 years ago in so many ways and just as cruel. But my sessions kept saying, no, no, look deeper. There is an emerging greatness in humanity. And again, I understand this within reincarnation. There is to see humanity is not just to see the present generation, but is to see the living pulsing of life incarnating again and again over many thousands of years and the greatness that is emerging is a greatness that's emerging at that deeper level of accumulation of the soul which is collecting and harvesting all the learning all the suffering all the experimentation all the courage all the innovation that's been we're cultivating through all of these lifetimes so the, my sessions kept showing me that there is a greatness emerging in the human story and that there was a, we were coming into a decisive turning point in history, but it never showed me how it was going to 
realize this. I had no idea how this was going to come about. And then in the 55th session, it took me into what I call the Great Awakening session. It took me deep into the future, and it took me there in order to allow me to experience the death and rebirth of the human species. And I don't mean that as a physical death and rebirth, but a, a sort of a psycho-spiritual death and rebirth, but a death and rebirth that did involve much physical suffering and many deaths. And I had this experience not as Chris Beige or not as even Chris Beige in a, an expanded version of myself, but I had the experience as the entire species. My consciousness had dissolved into the collective psyche so that I experienced a profound crescendo of suffering and a birth coming out of this suffering that was a birth of a new human being, a new form of human being. Basically, I experienced a historical period of an unraveling, loss of control, <clears throat> an inability to control the circumstances of our life, a tremendous kind of confronting of the sins of the fathers. We are our own fathers, of course, so a confronting of our past, a confronting of all the foibles and the limitations and the divisiveness of history and the short-sightedness of our forms of governance that we had emerged. And it, it was a global systems crisis that seemed to be driven by a global ecological crisis, but a global systems crisis where humanity was basically forced ultimately into simply trying to survive. And for a time, it looked like we weren't going to survive. It looked like it was an extinction event. It looked like we were going to lose our place in existence altogether. But just when the storm was at its peak, just when things were at their worst, it was as if a hurricane passed over the island and the skies began to clear. And when the skies began to clear, there were many survivors. There had been many deaths, but there were many survivors. And when the survivors began to pick themselves up and began to move forward and find each other, there sprang forth from within each of them individually and from within the collective new ways of knowing, new ways of feeling, new understandings, new insights. Fundamentally, at its core, there was the birth of an, an appreciation of oneness, an experience of oneness, not as a theory, not as kind of an ideology, but an experience of that tree that underlies individual leaf consciousness, that we truly are one, we truly are connected to each other. And in that birth of that awareness, we began to build a new world, not the world created by the ego. And the ego is a magnificent expression of creativity. The ego is magnificent, but the ego is divided from the fundamental springs of, of consciousness and from each other. And the world which the ego has created is a divided world. It's a, it's a world which favors some portions of society at the expense of others. It's not a world that works for all. <clears throat> but with the birth of oneness, with the birth of this transformation, we began to build a new world. We began to build a world which truly, truly did work for all, in which there was, it was truly a new beginning. And this creativity, these new ideas, they fed upon themselves. So there was a cascading of, of more and more beauty, more and more knowledge, more and more understanding. And I think what was taking place, what I experienced was a collective birth of the diamond soul that the soul was waking up on earth, that we were waking up and understanding ourselves to be not simply hundred year old beings. We were waking up and experiencing ourselves to be hundred thousand year old beings with relationships, a hundred thousand years old. And in that awareness, we not only experienced a much deeper compassion 
with other human beings and other life forms altogether. But we experience greater transparency to the creative intelligence of the universe itself. We were no longer experientially isolated from the cosmic intelligence of the universe, but we could take in deeper downloads from the intelligence of the universe. And with these deeper downloads, there was no technological problem which we could not solve because we were awake intellectually at deeper levels. We could understand things. Understandings came easier. There was no technological barriers to what we could accomplish in this world. This is the birth, what I call the birth of the future human. And I think the future human is the diamond soul incarnating in history. In my, one of the last great vision of my journey in the 70th session, when I thought I was beyond all the meltdowns that I'd gone through before, I'd gone through so many meltdowns, it put me through the worst strip down of my entire 20 year journey. It just broke me down terribly. And I think it was necessary in order to give me the experiences that followed. And it took me deeper into the future than it had ever taken me before. And in this condition, one of the experiences that unfolded there is that it gave me yet again and my deepest experience of the future human. It was as if I was allowed to try on for size the new archetype of the new human that had emerged, had been birthed in, the, in evolution. And just touching this being was so extraordinary. Just, if I try to describe it, I don't think I can do it without crying. Just a magnificent beauty, just an, a completely healed humanity, healed of all the scars that it had accumulated through all those thousands of years of incarnating. A heart, an ex explosively large heart, a magnificent, a magnificent mind, a, capable of illumination that staggers the imagination. This is the child which we're trying to give birth to. This is the child which I think we are beginning to give birth to in this century. I think we are entering the dark night of our collective soul. And just as in mystical traditions before, in order for full spiritual realization to emerge, there must take place a dark night of our soul, which is a time of purification, a time of confronting the poisons that are left over from our past behaviors and opening. And, and as this dark night comes to fruition, there is a, a death, a death to that old self and a birth of something new. And when that new opens, it basically, all the mystics and all the great saints tell us the same thing. It makes all the purification worthwhile. It makes all the hardships worthwhile. That's when a mother gives birth, when she holds her child, then the pains of labor are forgotten. It, they're worthwhile. I think something like that is happening for humanity. We are in the process. We have been gestating the new humanity for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. Reincarnation, lifetime by lifetime. We've been gestating the new humanity. Gestation takes a long time. Birth is a short time. Birth is a very intense process. And I think we are in a collective dark night of the, of the soul. Now, we may just be in the early stages of it. I think we are maybe in what John of the Cross called the dark night of the self, which is the early stage of purification and transformation. But these will be followed by deeper purification, deeper transformation, until eventually we'll let go of our past. Until eventually, when it hurts so much to stay as we were, we'll begin to open up into who we can be and who we need to be in order to save life on this planet. In that process, I think we're giving birth to the new humanity. And when we give birth to the new humanity, we will look back over the whole of human evolution and all the suffering that has been involved. And we will say, not that it wasn't real, not that it wasn't terrible, but that in a larger 
order of things, it was worth it. Because now we are operating at a completely different blueprint of the human psyche. So I think we're in hard times. We're in for hard times ahead. But I think these are magnificently important times, extremely creative times, and times which will demand a great deal from us individually and collectively. But if we engage them conscientiously, if we engage them heart and soul, I think they're going to change our life individually and the life of our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren forever. So that's, that's the visions that were poured into me. And so that's, I just share them with you. Wow. That's, uh, that's, that really leaves me speechless. It's, it's hard. It's hard knowing what to say to that. That's beautiful. Absolutely yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I can see how, I can see how that removes any anxiety really about death and about life and about the future of, us um, as individuals or species. It's just a mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful vision. Mm -hmm. So but every yeah. time we die, you know, <clears throat> of course, at a deepest level, all the spiritual traditions tell us no one dies. We just transition into a different level of reality. And I'm not making light of death and I'm not trivializing at all, but just affirming this deeper insight that, Everything we are survives the death of this body. And at the end of every lifetime, we return to where we came from as a resting place. And we are restored and refreshed. And then we return to the challenges of history. You know? So it's, it's, we don't have to go through all the evolutionary future in order to know freedom from fear of death. In fact, one of the, if there were one thing from my psychedelic experiences that I wish I could, I could give to the world, it would be uh, eliminating the fear of death. And I not only am not afraid of dying, I'm looking forward to it you know, because death is homecoming. Always death is homecoming. I know different spiritual traditions have said that in different ways, but I find Carl Jung, he says at one point that life is a short period between two infinities, which in the end mm. might just be one. So I think that's a beautiful yeah. way of yeah. putting it. Yeah. Um, yeah, beautifully said. Yeah. There, there is one more thing that he says that I want to ask how you see this in light of your experiences. Mm. Carl Jung used to say, I can... I can either be good or I can be whole. So he had a tremendous respect for the dark side of the psyche, for evil. Yeah. So how do you see, do you see evil falling away as our egos fall away when we become this future human? Or do you see some deeper logic to evil continuing and becoming integrated and then serving some higher purpose? Well, I would begin by differentiating between darkness and evil. People often fuse those, but I think they're, they're different. Uh, darkness, evil is a kind of a twisting of life. It is a, a, a process in which life in some way has turned in upon itself and has cut itself so deeply off from its source that it has become uh, twisted, cancerous, uh, and needs to be uh, restored, needs to be healed. Darkness, on the other hand, is simply part of the inertia of existence. It's part of, it's kind of like what, what the Big Bang explodes into. It's what it's what is the resistance to the creative process itself. But I think when, when Jung talked about I'd rather be whole than be good, he was claiming all the parts of his life which weren't necessarily socially good or even that he would deem good. He was claiming the whole of his life. 
And I think that's, that happens in spiritual practice and it certainly happens in psychedelic practice. We grab the whole of our life. We grab all aspects of it, even the parts that, that we're embarrassed by and the parts we're ashamed of or the parts that we feel are unforgivable. We embrace them all. And as we embrace them all, all those twisted or unintegrated or injured aspects of ourself are brought back into healing and are brought back into wholeness so that there emerges out of that wholeness, a higher order of goodness, a different order of goodness. Uh, but it is, it, it, it is that commitment to embracing the shadow to let no corner of our being be excluded from redemption, we might say. Nothing can be left out. Otherwise, the, the system is incomplete. It's like uh, there's a chorus, but some of the voices are gone. We have to have all of them present for the chorus to be complete. So that in evolution, in our social evolution, in our spiritual evolution, clearly there is much darkness in the world. There is much twisted, so we could say there is much evil. But I don't think of evil as a cosmological process. I've never experienced it that way. I've never experienced evil in that way. I've experienced darkness, I've experienced confusion, I've experienced pain and suffering, but not evil as such. And I think that's what Sri Aurobindo, I mean, what Ramakrishna meant when he said, if you want to understand God, you must look suffering in the face. And suffering doesn't come from a second principle. It doesn't come from an evil demiurge. It comes from the divine. Suffering is part of the divine expression. We have to understand how life works. And we must look deep. If we're going to see the compassion in existence, we must be able to look very, very deep uh, because, because there is so much suffering. But I, and I think the suffering is in the process of being redeemed in history in the sense that it is part of a self-learning process which is taking us somewhere. And it's taking us somewhere exciting and somewhere magnificent. So I guess I would say that darkness is being redeemed in evolution. Uh, I don't think, I don't know what will happen as we make this transition into this higher form of humanity. I'm sure that even if we did make this transition within a thousand years, say, or even sooner into a higher manifestation of human experience on the planet, it doesn't end there. You know, it's, we're going to keep going for millions of more years, billions of more years. Uh, so I'm sure there will be challenges that we'll face. and There'll be thresholds that we'll face. But along the way, I think we're, we just have to let go of some of the early stories that we've been telling ourselves, that somehow evil has its hand on the earth, or somehow that there is a malevolent force that intends us to suffer this way, or that we can escape this suffering by simply being good, experiencing salvation, and, and going to heaven when we die, and leaving the earth behind, and it, just not being here anymore. We just have to let go of a lot of our old stories and open up into a deeper understanding of the cosmological process of creation, self-manifestation of the creative intelligence. Chris, um, I must realize that I'm taking quite a lot of your time. So um, before uh, we finish, I want to ask you, now that you've written your book, because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you uh, discontinued, you finished your LSD sessions, and then you took 20 years, was it? And then you published your, your book 20 years later. So... Yeah. So how has the writing of your book and then doing of, you know, mm -hmm. speaking about your experiences, how has that changed your insights and what is left for you to do in this lifetime? What, uh, yes. Yeah. Learn to cook. <laughs> 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 well, maybe let me back up a little bit and describe what happened when I stopped my work. Uh, Cause that'll, lead into the writing of the book. Uh, I stopped my work in 99 and I stopped it for a number of reasons. 
but foremost among them, I stopped it because the the domain of diamond luminosity that I entered. And in those last five years and 26 sessions, I entered this reality only four times. And in between those four entrances into the diamond luminosity, there were very, very intense purifications and healings and catharsis that were taking place. But I entered that joy of dissolving into the light and it made coming back, I reached a point where it was just too painful to come back into time space. And there was a sadness in coming back. And I knew I had to, uh, I couldn't take being separated from the universe, that deep intimacy. Again, uh, I couldn't take entering into the joy and then coming back out of the joy anymore that I had to let go. Uh, there were other things going on. I was also running enormous energy in my body that I realized I was really kind of at a subtle energy level. I was running too hot. I needed to stop and let my system calm down and, and let my subtle energy system recalibrate. But the primary reason I stopped is because of a heartache. I couldn't, I couldn't take coming back anymore. So I stopped. And I had been given so many blessings through the years and had been shown so many things that I thought I could just stop and I would continue to be nourished by the treasures that I had been given, by the diamonds that I had been given. And it, that's true. And that did happen. But that turned out to be only half of what happened. I found over the years that followed a deep sadness emerging in my life. And I, I began to realize that underneath all the things I was doing, publishing and writing and taking care of my children and teaching, that there was a, a, a sadness, a longing that I was suffering from a loss of communion with the divine. I was suffering from a loneliness with the divine. And I basically was just waiting to die. I was living my life, taking care of everybody. But in my heart, I was just waiting to die so I could return to my beloved. And years went on and it didn't get better. And I began to realize that uh, this is not this is not good. It's not good living your life waiting to die. It's good to be completely fearless of death, but it's not good to be waiting to die. That somewhere along the way, I must have made a mistake. I must have done something wrong somewhere. My life was screaming failure to integrate. But because I had taken so much care to integrate each individual session, it wasn't clear where my failure lie, lay. So I turned to find where I had made a mistake. And in time, I came to understand that there was an imbalance in my life. It was like I had plunged myself so deep into the transcendent divine that I had lost my foothold in the manifest divine. I had gone so deep into the transcendent dimension that I had lost hold of the other truth. I mean, I knew it intellectually but I wasn't able to live it fully. And that is the truth that the physical universe and my being as part of the physical universe is the divine. The physical world is the body of the divine. So when I began to see that the, ch the problem was this imbalance between transcendence and imminence, I made a, a decisive move to embrace the, my physical existence more completely to really by a force of will and by a cultivation of practices to live my life as I was in its incompleteness for the remaining days on this earth and to recommit myself to being here inside time and space on this planet. And as part of this process, and it took me about 10 years to get fully comfortable being inside time and space again.
and which is maybe one more reason why no one should do the kind of work that I did. You know, I hope that people don't have to go through what I went through. I, I think maybe it's better to work in smaller doses and more incremental stages and make maybe smaller progress, but also hold on to more of the progress that you do make in opening up to transcendence. But along the way, I also learned that there was a second reason for my kind of estrangement or unhappiness. And the second reason was what I call the sickness of silence. I'm a teacher. I love to learn and I love to share what I've learned. But because of the laws surrounding psychedelics and because of the, our psychedelic phobic culture, I wasn't allowed to talk about what I had experienced. I wasn't allowed to bring my psychedelic knowledge into the classroom. I wasn't allowed to share it with my colleagues. So the silence which had allowed me to do this work at this time in history was also not allowing me to fully integrate it into my personal life, into my public life. I integrated them privately, psychologically, as best I could, but I couldn't integrate them into my historical presence. I couldn't be in the real world, in the physical world, who I knew myself to be in the shamanic world. And in this respect, writing Diamonds from Heaven uh, has been a deep healing process to finally, now that I've, I've retired, and I retired a little early in order to write this book, but to finally be in a position where I'm able to say what I did, to say what happened to me in these sessions, and to share the experience of the universe. And not that I think my experience is in any way unique or special, because it's just I'm one person among a whole psychedelic community that's having all of these types of experiences. But to finally be able to be completely honest and candid that this is what I've been doing all these years. This is who I am in my inner life, behind my public persona of my academic life. That has been very healing. And it's also done some interesting things. Uh, as I was working on the book and the years of working on the book, and as I've begun to talk about it, uh, my psychedelic memories have begun to congeal and to live in me differently than they lived in me before I was talking. So just to be able to talk about these things with you and, and with other people has allowed me to be more whole within myself. It's like the psychedelic half of my life and the physical half of my life are coming together and something is happening. Uh, something, there is a deepening of integration and a deepening of transparency to spiritual reality. And I don't know where it's going to go. Uh, I truly don't. I, I think in three years from now, I could be in a very different place than I am now. And I'm in a different place now than I was before I wrote the book. So I think, you know, uh, Pim Van Lommel is a near-death episode researcher, and he wrote a wonderful book on near-death episodes. And he says at the end of the book that his experience with people who have near-death experiences is that integration can't really take place until they can talk about their experiences and share them. And I think that's true with psychedelic experiences too, that at some levels we can't fully integrate our experiences until we can share them. And I think writing Diamonds from Heaven has been part of sharing my history. Hopefully that'll be useful to other people and it'll support them in their work and, and as we go into this intense historical period. So uh, there's been a, a, um, a birth of a new joy in a way, a, a birth of just being able to be who I really am, which is a flawed human being who's had some pretty unusual experiences and uh, loves to be in conversation with other human beings who have also had unusual experiences so that we can together see what our experiences have taught us about the universe that we're in. Yeah, well, Chris, your uh, experiences and your words are truly diamonds from heaven. And I'm sincerely 
grateful and I want to express your gra gratitude for for well for your courage to undertake these experiences and to share them and to speak about them not just to me but to so many people and I know I can speak for myself and I know for others that your work really touches people's uh, people's hearts and people's lives and I think it's very important work so I really thank you on the behalf of not only myself but the greater mm -hmm. collective um, so I, I thank you very much. Um, I, again, I, I really don't want to take too much of your day, but is there anything that we didn't touch that you'd like to talk about? Hmm. Maybe just one piece because I think there's a lesson for me in this and maybe a lesson for others. I had an experience in the 50th session, which was the second diamond luminosity session, the second time I was taken deep into diamond luminosity. And so this was the deepest I ever got in any of my sessions into the deep structure of the universe. And I was in a place of ex extraordinary bliss and joy and I had dissolved completely into the boundaryless condition of just pure light, just hyper, hyper clear, clear light, just so clear. And just in, when I was at this peak of 50 sessions and, and all these years of experience, all of a sudden my entire visual field rotated 90 degrees and a space opened up and I saw reality far, far in the distance, filled with an, an even higher form of light. And a beam of light came out of that reality and hit me. And it absolutely shattered me. And I realized at that point that the journey into the divine or the journey into the universe was infinite. There's no end to it. Because like many people, I had thought, that you did this work, you took the journey in order to get to the end, in order to get home, in order to get to back to source, become one with God, or to dissolve into the primal void. But I had become one with the divine, and I had learned that there are many levels of oneness, and I had dissolved into the void, but I learned that there were many levels of, of the void to dissolve into. But this experience showed me that even using this extraordinarily powerful method, I would never, ever be able to explore the universe in its totality. It's just so big, so vast, with so many layers to it, such wonderful expanse. And this, was, this represented a fundamental pivot. First, it just shook me to the core to realize the true expanse of what I was involved in. And then it relaxed me into, uh, into a, just a deep sense of existential relaxation. And this is why if I were doing this work over again, I would be gentler with myself because I've learned that the goal is not to try to get to some destination, not to get to some place. Because no matter how hard I pushed, new doors kept opening and new doors kept opening. Now I understand that a better way to think about this work is that we open ourselves and we make ourselves porous to the totality of life and we let in as much of this knowledge and as much of the energy and as much of the compassion as it's possible. We let it in and we try to hold it and bring it into our being and enter and become more porous to it and open to it. So it's, it's not a process of kind of going out and exploring, it's really a process of intaking bringing it in and and bringing it into the very roots of our being let it change not only our mind and our convictions but letting it change our biology literally it reaches into and changes i think as at very subtle physiological levels that we're maybe just beginning to appreciate and and haven't begun to map yet and once you understand that it's not about trying to get to the end of this road but it's really about becoming more conscious and more skillful as we stand between two realities, 
one reality in time space and the other reality outside of time and space, the, nurture, the mother universe and the daughter universe. We are in the daughter universe. We are always surrounded and infused by the mother universe. And if we can stand astride both worlds and integrate the constant inflow of the life from the mother universe in increasing measure inside the daughter universe, then that kind of, uh, that brings a, an instantiated joy, an incarnate joy, a, a, a sense of richer and richer presence inside time and space as we allow time and space to become increasingly transparent to that which created time and space. So I would encourage a gentler, uh, a gentler psychedelic process, a gentler in entry into the great expanse. And I would be, I'm more patient now with how long spiritual unfolding takes than maybe I was when I was a young man. <laughs>